The whole story began uh, about uh, 40 years ago when I received a phone call from a man called Bob Lynn who explained that uh, his friend was Lionel Jeffries and Lionel was interested in buying the film rights uh, for the railway children. I thought it was somebody kidding me uh, because I never had a phone call from somebody who was a film producer and Bob Lynn became the, the producer of the film. I think Lionel uh, was so taken by Oakworth, Oakworth Station and everything about it that he, they thought that they would give Oakworth Village the credit and therefore they retained the name Oakworth and that's how it came to be in the film. Lionel Jeffries always said that it, it was because there wasn't really anywhere else to go. Um, there was, uh, he needed a tunnel and quite a few other topographical features that um, the only other standard gauge railway, which was the Bluebell Railway, down in Sussex, uh, it didn't have. So at the time, 40 years ago, people were not very used to having film cameras around. Today, everybody's used to seeing film cameras and having sound boom thrust in front of them in every shopping precinct. It wasn't like that 40 years ago. We'd only had a couple of other short films, one advert, and, and the BBC had been here about three years before, uh, before we reopened, making a, 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 the same thing, the Railway Children. And so it, was, it really was quite an event, and, uh, and everybody wanted to be involved, and there were hundreds of people down at Oakworth every day watching it all being filmed. Very exciting. I mean, every day after school, uh, the kids who lived around the railway, whether it was at Haworth who were filming Oxenhoe or uh, Oakworth, uh, the kids after school would come down and watch the shooting that was going on. To have a big film unit here was a huge excitement in itself. And people used to come down and throng around the outskirts of this station just to see those stars and just to watch what was going on because it was such a big event in this village and in this valley. Everybody was involved to some degree with the film. But one of my jobs was I drive a thing called a diesel rail bus. That's a four wheel vehicle with a cab at each end, diesel engine and about 50 seats. My uh, main claim to fame is that I was an extra on the railway children and uh, my two children were extras with me and my uh, first late husband Bob Cryer uh, not only was the instigator uh, behind the preservation of that line uh, but he also became, uh, once uh, you know, it got underway, he became the technical advisor to the film The Railway Children and he's credited as such. When the Railway Children was made, I was at school at Roundy in Leeds and our teacher came and asked if anyone wanted to be an extra in the film. And we had a rehearsal and uh, Lionel Jeffries came along and listened to the rehearsal and wandered around and looked at everybody. They said that they wanted 20 lads of assorted shapes and sizes and being tall I was easily chosen. I remember Lionel Jeffries wandering around the band while we were rehearsing peering at us very close with a, a gadget. I think he was looking for craggy features and things that might fit in with 1904. Really, you can't form a band on just features. It has to be on playing ability as well. That's why I came in. <laughs> this is a film, this is a, a black and white picture of myself, John and Jane, with Dana Sheridan, Jenny Agatha and Gary, who was the brother. And uh, this is in front of a steam engine at Oakwood Station. When they filmed the, uh, the, the, the Railway Children, it was, it was about Easter, as I remember. It must have been, because I remember the school holidays were on. And um, the, the weather was glorious. Everybody was in short sleeves and, and this sort of thing. A uh, little bit different from today. As you can see, it's uh, fairly classic Haworth gloom, is this. The first thing we actually saw was the, uh, uh, all the coaches lined up on what used to be number four road in Haworth Yard, uh, uh, for specifically uh, for the filming people who were involved. These coaches eventually became uh, massive wardrobes and uh, uh, gowns and all sorts of things hung from uh, carriage racks. Coupes were used as dressing rooms, uh, one for Dana Sheridan and the other, I think it was Bernard Cribbins. Forty years ago, Jenny Agatha and Sally Thompson and Gary Warren, who played the children, were practically unknown. The big thrill for those of us who were here was working with the established adult stars 
Lionel Jeffries himself, who had been a noted comedy actor with uh, uh, Bernard Cribbins in a number of black and white movies, was, was a big name. Uh, so was William Mervyn, who played the old gentleman. He was very much a star of a BBC TV series at the time, All Gas and Gators. And uh, Dinah Sheridan, who was returning to the big screen after um, a great triumph in Genevieve. Uh, with Kenneth Moore a few years previously. So the excitement was being with the big adult stars. I'm so awfully glad it's you. When I just think of all the old gentlemen there are in the world, it could have been anyone. You're not going to take Jim away, though, are you? Not at present. Your mother has most kindly consented to let him stay here. When I met William Mervyn, it really was a great pleasure. He was a, a lovely a old gentleman, and to me, he was the casting was just absolutely perfect for him. He was such a, an unassuming person and really the perfect gentleman and unfortunately we don't get that too often these days. He used to commandeer the train when it wasn't being used and whisk us off to Haworth and I remember having my first ever illicit pint in a pub in the Royal Oak at Haworth with Bill Mervyn banging on the table with his silver cane and demanding 12 pints you know, from the landlord and this sort of thing. I remember one day when we had uh, been sitting, chatting, just after he'd finished filming and we were just talking about um, the railway and the railway children and uh, he just said out of the blue uh, I don't know what I've done with my life he seemed a little bit sad about it and I said well just think of all the joy and pleasure that you've given to these people over the years how much more could you really want to do with your life and uh, to my surprise, he took his hand in mine and kissed me on the cheek and, uh, and thanked me. And I thought, well, yes, he really was the lovely old gentleman. Charming. Charming. Bernard uses so many phrases that never appear in the book. You know, I, I don't know, I've never seen a thing more like a buttercup without it were a buttercup. And my theory about this has always been that Lionel Jeffries trusted him so much, they'd worked together on a number of films, and I think he just allowed Bernard free reign to put his own ad libs in. So we have some wonderful phrases, which are still used when people gather in pubs around this area. On the way, Mr Mitchell! And give it to Bert! <laughs> the memory that sticks most is that when we turned up on the day, it was absolutely chucking it down and uh, we spent about the first two hours sat in the waiting room and eventually a uh, crate of beer arrived. Lionel Jeffries got playing the drum. Well, I won't say he was playing the drum, was trying to knock seven bells out of it. <laughs> and they were getting a bit carried away and he said, uh, come on, he said, we'll march up the street. And it was melting, you know. So I said, Lionel, if you want to march up the street, off you go, but we're staying here. <laughs> it was most amusing to see some of the things. They had a security chap and a dog that was called Wide Awake Securities. I've never seen a more non-awake securities in my life. They're a, a huge obsession, absolutely toothless. Anybody could have patted that dog and have gone to sleep. And uh, that was the sort of thing what went on then. It was so easy going. Do you remember the joiner running down that field with a great long plank of wood over his shoulder? The director or somebody had said, I want to stand there, and this this joiner, yeah. stripped to the waist, galloped down the field with a great long plank of wood, and the next thing, frantically sawing this piece of wood, bang, 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 and bingo, there was a platform, just like that. It was gorgeous sunny weather for weeks on end. It was amazingly hot. Um, we had a wonderful buffet lunch on the top of the tunnel halfway through the day. The one thing we always liked was they used to term it the chuck wagon. Uh, when the food came, and it was really a, a right good dude of food, absolutely superb. There's lads up there who never got up before 10 o'clock and get up at 7 to get to that chute wagon. Come along, Bobby, it's a real feast. Sardines, biscuits, ginger, raisins. No, Phil, no, you do not put the marmalade spoon into the sardines. Oh, no, it's gorgeous, Mummy. <laughs> It was, it was really like a sort of club for a couple of months while they were filming it. We, we all got to know each other in one first name terms with everybody. And it was great fun, it really was. One of the things 
many people want to know, where were the various scenes filmed? Uh, where was Three Chimneys? Where was the fence where the children sat and waved? What a lot of people don't realize is those two locations are about uh, two miles apart. I think they have to run fairly quickly <laughs> to get down that hill. Uh, the tunnel where the runners went through, that's just down the way from here. This part of the valley is called Mythomes. It's a, a, a very ancient name. It's Norse, actually, is Mythomes, Sax Saxon and Norse combination. And over on my left-hand side up here, this is where the, the boys from Roundhay School came down when the paper chase happened. Um, our main scenes were the um, paper chase scene where we ran in a tunnel and we came down there um, and had to run down the tunnel and disappear out the other side. And on the far side of the tunnel is the place where the landslide happened. Um, and up behind where the camera is, up on my right, that's where the children used to sit on the fence and wave at the train as it came out of the tunnel. One of the things that they were very good at when they put the film together was um, making people think it was a really long railway and this tunnel behind me was extremely long because it used to belch smoke and things like that and in fact what they did uh, was just take little bits of films and add it all together and it made it, it gave the impression that all these locations were, were a long way apart and in fact they're all within a couple of hundred yards of each other and the tunnel behind me which as you can see is not really much more than a long bridge although it is a, it is a real tunnel it was cut through the hill to make it look longer they used to drape canvas screens over the far end and put an engine inside and have lots and lots of smoke come out and, and that way it looked like a really, really long tunnel, but in fact it wasn't. There were four different locomotives used in the film. The one we saw most of all was the one on the old gentleman's train, which is the lovely yellow ochre coloured locomotive. And um, that has kind of taken itself into, itself into the hearts of people as kind of something special because the old gentleman was the one who kind of saved the day by getting the father out of prison and all that sort of thing. So I think that's one of the special things. The one behind us here um, was at that time painted green and was the green dragon. It was painted specially green for the film because I think maybe the script had to have a green one. It was like a great dragon tearing by. Even then it felt like magical summer days with steam trains in the green English countryside, all that kind of thing. When the film was made, we all went to the audience at Leeds to see it and we were absolutely amazed the thing came out. I wasn't just sure about the film at first um, because having been in it, you didn't realise how it would come out. And then suddenly it all came together and we could see ourselves and all the locals were hooting, saying, oh, that's me, you know, looking, there I am. And Lionel very kindly ensured uh, that uh, we were sent invitations for the world premiere in Leicester Square. And therefore we went down with, both of us wearing fairly scruffy duffel coats. I had to buy a long dress, because I didn't have one, from C&A, because it was cheap. And uh, we both went, had a taxi, and we walked up the red carpet with, we, we took our duffel coats off because it she looked so scruffy and everyone else was so glamorous. I've got to say, I, I never actually realised it was me until about the third or fourth time I saw it. And then it suddenly clicked with me, oh, that, you know, that was me. And uh, I didn't get a credit though. I only got five pounds for doing it. It was a lot of money then. I can only see myself once, even though we, we, the, the, the shots with me working on are about four or five of them. Uh, but I can see myself once. Um, quite amazing. I remember just sitting in the darkness and the film starting and you know how it starts and it's quite magic and I was just completely transformed uh, you know it was it was it was absolutely wonderful uh, to see what we'd seen in production but you've no idea how it's gonna actually turn out on the big screen and it was just absolutely it was magical. I'm glad the railway actually succeeded in in getting this thing over with. But both Brian and myself were a little bit disappointed. We were stood outside and nobody asked for our autographs. I hope you enjoyed it. Well, we, we noticed the difference after the filming very quickly. 
it, it was dramatic the, the difference it made this it was a sleepy little branch line that had opened, reopened a couple of years before and we were running and perhaps carrying a couple of hundred people a day in two coaches um, literally two days after the film opened we, we just simply couldn't cope and we were running six coach trains and we were turning people away but there's so many people turned up that just about every trip there seemed to be another carriage added for the railway um, it was a defining moment in its development uh, remember in 1970 the railway had only been going for a couple of years um, so it was starting it was one of the first preserved steam railways in the country to a certain extent I think the railway matured during the railway during the filming because we had been a bunch of amateurs perhaps regarded as you know slightly eccentric and we came to maturity at that time ever since then we we still try on occasions to say all oh, the railway children's old hat and people won't want to hear about it again but we keep getting people coming back constantly asking about it. it's the one thing that everybody asks about it was such a lovely family film and i think it's nice for people that come and they can pick out the house and see where it was all done and listen to all the stories because everybody in the railway's got a little story of their own. The Worthwhile Railway really never looked back from there. It brought it a great deal of fame and I think affection. The children that were there at the time, I mean they talk about it and that they have their memories of it and uh, I know that my own two children saw the film so many times that they were word perfect <laughs> And they used to say, oh, Dad, not the real with children again. <laughs> so it became very much a family joke that uh, it was played more than once in our house. The people of this whole valley, of all the villages and of the town of Keithley, have a tremendous pride in this film because it's endured so well, because it's become a sort of icon of British film history. I even saw somebody come along and kiss the platform, such as the people's fondness for the film. A few weeks ago, I was in charge of Oakwood Station and the, a family jumped off the train um, and immediately the children went into a reenactment of one of the scenes from the film. With a little girl running down the platform with her hands in the air shouting, Daddy, my daddy! Running towards her brother who was playing the part of daddy. And it just illustrates, I think, how important the railway is to, to people who are, are enjoying the book, enjoying the films, uh, and, and come back to Oakworth to uh, see where it was all filmed. I'm president of the Keithley and Worth Valley Railway Preservation Society, and I think it, it's got us a place in history that perhaps we wouldn't have had otherwise. I don't mean me personally, I mean the actual area, as you've said, the area and the railway. We've got that place in history because every time anyone watches that wonderful film, The Railway Children, they actually see our railway with our people doing the jobs, doing the driving, doing the guarding and everything. And if ever I think there was a guardian angel watching over the Worth Valley Railway, it was the day that Lionel Jeffries heard about it and came and made the film here. Very beautiful and wonderful things do happen, don't they? And we live most of our lives in the hope of them.